Morning, YouTubers. <laughs> On today's episode, we're going to be talking about stick welding, which I know a lot of you guys probably own stick welders, the old tombstone welders, or you got something around. I mean, it's probably the most common welding process that people at least have access to. So I thought I would do a whole series on how to stick weld. This is going to be the first kind of introduction video. And then there's going to be, I don't know, a ton of them. I'm not even going to count how many, at least 10 that are going to follow this video where I'm going to cover as much detail on every aspect of it as possible because I want to see you guys put down some real good welds with the process and get comfortable with it and become knowledgeable, I guess. So let's get into it. Since this is an intro to stick welding, I thought, well, why don't we talk about what is stick welding? So stick welding is a common term, at least one that I use, for the SMAW process, SMA, which stands for Shield Metal Arc Welding. You old school guys out there know it as arc welding. Well, I call it stick welding. All the same. We're referring to the same process. With stick welding, we use what's known as a rod. And in this case, it's a 6013 rod. All a rod is, is an alloy, which you can see it here, that the part that's exposed that you clamp to. And it's an alloy rod that's similar to the base metal you're gonna weld. So if you're welding steel, it's gonna likely be a steel alloy. If you're welding stainless steel, it's gonna be a stainless steel alloy. So pretty simple in that respect. Well, the rod is coated with a crushed up or kind of mix of what's called flux, okay? What this flux does is it does two things. As you're welding and you strike your arc and you're welding, the flux as it's exposed to the extremely high temperature of the electric arc Part of that flux turns into a gas. That gas shields a weld pool, just like if you're wire welding, like MIG welding, your shielding gas protects your weld pool. Well, the gas that's created when the flux gets uh, vaporized by the heat from the electric arc, so that shielding gas shields a weld pool. And then some of the flux essentially melts off on top of the weld and it turns into what's called slag. And I got a piece here that peeled off. So, and if you look at this, it's pretty thick. Different rods have different slag types and thicknesses. That's something I'll go more in depth when I talk about that in another video. But what you need to understand is, is that this slag protects that red hot weld. So not only are you creating a shielding gas to prevent the molten metal that you're depositing from being uh, exposed to oxygen and then thus having things like porosity and weld defects, but you're also protecting the weld that is solidifying from oxygen so that when you're done, your weld comes out nice, shiny, and silver because it's not oxidized. If you've ever welded with, say, MIG welding and your travel speed is too fast and you're running really hot, you're gonna often notice that your welds turned super gray and cooked. Well, that's because the shielding gas is no longer on the red hot weld. Well, in the case of this, with stick welding, that flux turns a slag and pr protects most of the weld. So you can oftentimes run really hot with stick and you still have a pretty shiny silver weld that's unoxidized, oxidized free. So that's uh, pretty cool. Um, again, I'm not gonna go in super depth on this. I'm gonna do a video all about every common stick rod so you get a better idea. But I will mention the numbers on a rod refer to very simple things. So some rods have an E in front of it, that means electrode. The first two numbers, which in the case of this are six zero, that refers to tensile strength. 60 means 60,000 PSI tensile strength. And by tensile strength, they take a chunk of this weld and then they pull it. 
and the pressure that a very specific diameter or machine size piece of it, so in height and in width, the amount of pressure it takes to separate it is the tensile strength. So uh, 70 rod, so like 7018, has a higher tensile strength than a 60 rod, okay? The third number, which in this case is a one, the one refers to position. A one means all position, which means you can weld vertical up, you can weld horizontal, so horizontal would be like this position. So a one means you can weld horizontally, it means you can weld vertical up, it means you can weld flat position, and it also means you can weld overhead. However, one does not necessarily mean you can weld what's called vertical down. So vertical down would be like where you start at the top and weld down. There's a lot of reasons why you wouldn't want to weld vertical down because it limits penetration, but some rods, even though they're labeled as a one rod, they are not able to be run vertical down. You can run into slag entrapment issues. But again, that's more ahead of us where we're at now. And the last number, the three, that's referring to the flux composition. If you have multiple rods and they all have, say, a three as the last number, they're going to be of similar uh, flux composition. That uh, really isn't super important to know, but it does give you a heads up. Like if you use a 7014 and a 7024, they're probably going to run similar when you're actually welding, simply because a flux is similar. Again, it's not an exact comparison there. The last thing I'll mention is every rod that you're going to run into, like your 6013, your 7018, your 7014, 7024, 6011, all those, right? Every one of them runs a little different. I call it a personality, but every one welds a little bit different. Some of them are a lot easier to run and make a really good looking weld than others. Like 7024, you could probably be uh, deaf, blind, and drunk, and probably still run a pretty nice looking bead with that very forgiving rod versus 6010. If you don't really know what you're doing, it makes very ugly welds. So that's all things to consider, but my videos coming up where I talk about each rod specifically will really help you out with that. That's far above where we're at now. So let's move on. So you want to get started with stick welding. Awesome. It's a great process, very versatile, it has its limitations, and it has its strengths. So the first thing you want to concern yourself with, because obviously I'm not there with you, is you need to figure out what polarity your welder can weld on. If you have an older Lincoln Tombstone or Miller Thunderbolt or something like that, a lot of those are AC only, where they cannot output DC. If you have a newer uh, stick machine or stick capable machine, odds are it can output DC and it probably doesn't output AC, but you need to identify what polarity your welder's capable of putting out. If you're AC only, you have to get rods like I have here, which is 6013, 6011, or 7018 that says it will work on AC. There's a couple other rods, like I think 7014 will. We'll check on that later. Um, those are all AC capable rods. Generally speaking, most people with AC only machines will either weld with AC 7018 or 6013. Very common, very versatile rods. So that's what you need to stick with. If you have a DC machine, then you can pretty much weld with any rod because all of them will run on DC. Now you have to mind your polarity though because some rods, uh, most of them prefer DCEP, where your stinger is on the positive. And let me give you an example. When you buy rods, if you pay attention to the packaging, like here, and these are 6010 5P, not the plus 5P plus, they say DC positive. So this particular rod, 6010, will not run on AC, but 6013, like I have down there, will. Again, verify 
before you buy, because you don't want to buy rods that won't work for you. With that said, today I'm going to start with 6013 rods. And I know a lot of you guys out there don't like 6013. You don't generally weld with it. I'm personally one that pretty much never welds with it. The reason being is that it really doesn't do anything that 7018 rods or 6010 doesn't for me. So I don't really have a reason to use it. But the awesome thing with this rod is that, if you look here, it says, here we go, 6013 is that this will run on all polarities, meaning DCE and DCEP, and it'll also run on AC. So by following along with me, your results should be pretty similar to me despite what welder you're using. And honestly, once you learn how to run these, it's not that bad. It's just a little different. It's not what I prefer. It's not harder. It's just a little bit different of a weld pool. So that's what we're gonna start with. So before we get started, I thought I would show you this. I found this in a toolbox that I was cleaning out today, and it just so happens that I could use it. Um, I've owned this, it came as part of a set, and I've never really used it, but what it provides could be useful to you, um, and today I will actually use it. So I don't know what amperage I should be running these 6013s down there at. Well, this gives me a great chart. All you do is you slide your little pointer up. We're running 6013 rods. We're running eighth inch, which is 3.2 millimeter. And this even gives you details, like it says what polarity it runs on. So electrode positive or electrode negative. It also works on AC. Let me get that in focus for you. Um, position is all position and then penetration it lists is low, which that's all pretty accurate. And it gives you your recommended amperage range. So 80 to 130 is our recommended amperage. I'm going to start at 90, and we're going to see how it welds. So there you go. Get one of these if you uh, run a lot of different rods or just as a little guide. Very helpful. So you got your test plate in front of you. If you don't have one, what I would recommend is a somewhere between 6 to 10 inch by uh you know, six to 10 inch square piece of steel. This is a piece of C-channel junk I had laying around. You want to clean it all nice to bright and shiny metal. You don't want to be welding on rust or mill scale because that can cause a lot of issues that you can't determine. Is it because of the material your welds look bad or is it because of your skill level? So this takes away any question as to what's causing the issue. Now, the hardest part about stick welding for most people is getting the arc started. Once you get it started, most people can kind of weld a bead of sorts, but it's very easy with some rods to get the arcs, it sticks at the start. Now, my machine, I can have what's called hot start and stick stuck, where basically the hot start boosts the amperage at the start, making it less likely to stick, which is awesome. And then if the machine detects that I've stuck the rod, it kills the output so that it's very easy to break it off. Um, your machine probably doesn't have that. That's all right. I've disabled all of that, so I'll be welding essentially with no features, just as likely most of you. So what I'm going to do is the first part of this, I'm going to start the arc a few times, stop, let it sit, start the arc, and I'm going to show you the actual process. Now, what you want to do is you want to get it close, like say within an eighth of an inch, bring it down just a little match strike like this. And you notice I'm bringing it off the plate. If you just push it down and then drag it, it's going to pass enough current to weld the tip of the rod right to your plate, and then it's stuck, okay? You don't want to do that. So you bring it down and up. And you notice how I keep that little bit of an arc gap there, but about a sixteenth of an inch. So I bring it down and up, bring it down and up. Where you get in trouble, like I said, is you don't want to do that.
All right, as you saw, I was able to start the rod multiple times, deposit a small little tack weld, kill the arc and then move on. And I did three, four of those. As you saw an in initial start, the rod actually stuck. I was able to very easily break it off and then restart. Uh, in a lot of cases, if you really stuck that rod, you're gonna wanna remove the stinger off the end of the rod and just let the rod tip cool and then break it off. If you stick it really good and then just yank it, you're gonna end up breaking the flex off the end of the rod and then the rod you're gonna have to clip back up higher otherwise it's gonna be junk. So as you notice, so the initial start a little bit harder, but once it got going, the restarts are a lot easier. Now some rods that's not the case, like with 7018, you're gonna have a lot harder time on restarts with that rod than this rod. And I can show you why. So when you look at these two rods, this is a brand new one, this is a used one. If you look, that exposed steel rod is all the way out at the tip. This guy has a built-in arc gap, essentially. So when you restart with this, it holds a proper arc gap, and when you strike it like a match, it's not going to stick because the rod isn't actually touching the metal like a brand new rod. So very easy to restart. So now that we got these tack welds here, uh, and my recommendation honestly would be to sit and do like a whole coupon of just starts. Once you can get your starts real good, then you can move on to actually running beads because your starting is going to be arguably harder than beads. But what I'll do, I'll fill up this whole plate with starts and then we're going to move on. So as you can see, we got essentially a series of tack welds. And that's really all that we were aiming to do is create little welds just from the start and then cutting the arc out and starting over. When you can do this right here, then you're not going to have any issues starting a rod. Now you saw 6013, very easy to restart the rod after you stop. One of the things you probably noticed as well is when I start, let it run just for a second. When I snap out, I kind of, and that's exaggerated, but I kind of whip the tip of the rod a little bit. A couple times it actually maintained an arc all the way out here. That's kind of undesirable, but if you do it fast enough, it'll break the arc. And not only does it break the arc, but the little molten ball of like silicon or silica, I think it's called silicon, silicon the little molten ball of metal and silicon on the end of the rod will go flying off of it, which makes restarts much, much easier. If I just stopped and then kind of, I don't know, long arced it to stop it and then tried to restart, it wouldn't be as easy on the restart because that ball is on the end. You'll really notice that with 7018 rods where you'll sit here and the rod won't restart and that's because you got that ball on the end. So if develop a little flick of it just to get rid of that ball and to break the arc. But when you can do this, you're ready for the next step. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna do little welds and we're gonna take a look at that. So the goal now, we're gonna run about two inch long welds. In order to do that, we're gonna start the arc just like we did. Once the arc initiates, we're gonna slowly drag the puddle that is visible back for, we'll make it about inch, inch and a half, somewhere in that ballpark. And then we're gonna break out of it just like you did for the tack weld for the starts and break out of it. Now, rod angle is very important with this. If you try and weld with a straight in rod angle like this, slag, especially with this rod, is gonna get 
in front of it, the flux is going to run in front of your weld pool and that's going to make your weld bead kind of entrap that slag. We don't want that. So we're going to focus on a slight angle and I'll show you on the camera here. We're aiming for something like this. Technically, you could run it as far back as this and make a weld. And depending on circumstances, you can almost be straight in, but we want a drag angle. You don't want to be pushing this stuff, and we want a slight drag angle. This is what we're going to be focusing on. And then as far as angle here, if you tilt this back like this, you're going to end up pushing that molten metal more over towards this. So I would recommend try and get it as straight up as possible. If we're welding this way, try and get it here or a slight angle like this. As your rod shortens, and this is simulating it shorten, if you start out with an angle like this, and that rod gets short, all of a sudden you're going to be welding like this with your stinger. That's not good. So having a slight angle this way is okay because as it shortens, as it shortens, you'll wind up a slight angle like that towards you. That's okay, but try and keep it as neutral as possible. All right, now if you look at that, the first start, a little bit harder. I don't have hot start enabled or anything, so it's a little bit more difficult to get the rod to start. But the first one, a little bit harder. Second one, if you look at the beads, the second pass is slightly wider than the first. The primary reason for that is this plate got preheated a little bit, and then that helped it wet out, so it flattened the bead out a little bit but they're very close to one another. Now, if you notice, let me really get in here. You see how the end of my weld kind of terminates and it somewhat flattens out, there isn't like a ball? That's because I snapped out of that rod really fast, out of the arc, and that left that. Ideally, that's what you want because the flatter that is and almost like a kind of divot, the easier it is to restart on that and then weld through. So you really want to snap out of the, the arc at the end of a weld. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to do a restart and then I'm going to start welding through. And we're going to do another inch and a half, inch and a quarter weld for both of those. Now, if you noticed, I didn't sit here and just beat the daylights out of this. I remember back a long time ago when I was learning the stick weld, 
I had to wear earplugs, not from the welding, but everyone in their booths were just, I don't know if they're using jackhammers or what, but just beating the daylights out of it. Well, you don't need to do that, especially with this rod. I mean, the flux, the slag pr practically peeled itself off. So let's look at what we got here. Now, my restart on the first one here, not the best. I'll take the blame on that. I should have started um, a little bit ahead of it and brought it back. And I'm a little low on the amperage. You can tell by, see how that's kind of roped up there? Not enough heat in this. Well, the preheat on the plate helped out a little bit. And you can see where my tie-in looks like there was almost no restart there. That's what you want to aim for. This video isn't really going to cover too much in depth on how to perfect restarts. I have a whole video that I'm going to do on that. But just understand that, you know, restarts are part of life. Like stick rods uh, are only so long. And if you go your whole welding experience or welding practice never doing restarts, that's completely impractical for real life. Like you, you need to get good at it. So don't fear it. It just takes practice. So again, down here, a little bit on the cold side once plate warms up, looking a little bit better. I snapped out of the arc fast, which left a little divot here. You want to get in the habit of that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue to do this all the way out. And then when I'm done, we'll talk about what we have there. All right, so I just completed the first set of welds. So you can see some of the starts and stops very good, like they tied in very well. Some of them not so much. Overall though, really not that bad, especially because I don't run this rod very much and we're running a little bit on the cold side. One of the things that you can really notice here is that when you look at the side profile of the bead, you see where the start and stop, it kind of tends to hump up a little bit. And that's really has to do because the amperage we're running is a little bit on the cold side. So 90 amps with this rod on what is uh, about a quarter inch, maybe a little bit bigger, especially when it comes to the end. It's a little bit too cold for this. If I bumped up the amperage a little bit, the tie-ins would have went a little bit better, like especially you can see here where it not terrible, not the best, but a little bit more amperage would have tied that in better. When you're capable of doing something to this level, doing your beads, your starts and stops, then you're ready to move on. And I know you might not want to hear this, and that's if you can't really do starts and stops that well, you should focus on doing that. I know you don't want to do a whole plate of starts and stops to get to this point, or close to this, but once you master this, stick welding is going to be infinitely easier for you. Trust me on that. You know, you have to remember that I've burned a lot of rods in, uh, over the last, I don't know, bunch of years. So where I'm at here is likely a lot further ahead than where you're at if you're just starting. So focus till you can get this, then move on. So. Our next step after getting this looking pretty good, which we're there, I'm there already, is we're going to run a whole rod end to end. Now, I'm not sure with the 6013 if I'll be able to use one rod and make it all the way to the end of the plate, but I'm going to try to. So that's what we're going to work on. So a quick tip here. One of the good ways to gauge if your rod will make it is on a flat weld like this, if you compare the rod length to the length of the weld, if you have at least 20% left of the rod, if you lay it flat over your metal length, you're going to make the whole weld. Now on fillet welds, that won't necessarily work simply because you're depositing more metal than just a bead on plate. But in this case, we're well over it. So this should be able to complete the whole weld without having to do a restart. 
not that you should only use full rods. That's not the point of this, but always use whatever you got. So if you need to restart on this, that's fine.